Okay, can I um, uh, call the meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the 14th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2019 and I trust you all had a quiet summer. Um, I'd particularly like to welcome our new committee member, Gail Ross, who is replacing Angus MacDonald on, on, Angus MacDonald on the committee. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Angus for all his hard work on the committee and wish him well in his new committee role. I know that he was on this committee and served with great distinction for seven years. And I certainly was very grateful for all his support when I became convener. And um, I've always appreciated the seriousness with which he has taken his responsibilities in this committee, his persistence on behalf of petitioners and been willing I think as we would all aspire to this committee to do all we can to deliver on um, the calls that petitions have um, prompted. And I, I wish him all the best in his new role. And I promise not to try and send too many petitions to his committee. Because uh, I don't think I want to see that, those eyes rolling again. Um, agenda item two. We're, sorry. And at this point, can I invite Gail to declare any relevant interests? Thank you, Convener. Um, given the wide-ranging scope of the committee, I would just like to refer members to my register of interests. Okay, thank you very much, and we look forward to working with you. Um, in agenda item two, we are required to choose a deputy convener to replace Angus MacDonald, who held that post. The Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as deputy convener of this committee, and can I invite members of that party to nominate one of their number for this post? Okay. And can I ask the committee whether they agree with the nomination for Deputy Convener uh, of Gail Ross? Okay. And can I congratulate um, Gail on her appointment? Thank you. Um, and I look forward, as I've said, to working with you. Um, agenda item three is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition for consideration today is petition 1723 on essential tremor treatment in Scotland, lodged by Mary Ramsey. The petition calls for the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to raise awareness of essential tremor and to support the introduction and use of a focus ultrasound scanner for treating people in Scotland who have this condition. According to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, essential tremor is the most common cause of disabling tremor and is distinct from Parkinson's disease. The cause of the tremor is not known, but it typically affects the arms and hands, although may also involve the head, jaw, tongues and legs. NICE also confirms that the first line of treatment includes medications such as beta blockers, anti-epileptics or sedatives. The second line of treatment includes different forms of brain surgery. The petition advocates the use of a non-invasive procedure known as focused ultrasound. This procedure has been the subject of a trial at the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust in 2016, with the full results expected to be published later this year. NICE has approved the use of this procedure on one, on one side of the brain since 2018. At this point, can I welcome Rhoda Grant, MSP? I know that you've been involved with the petitioners, and I wonder if you want to make a contribution at this point. Um, thank, thank you, Convener. Um, Mary Ramsey is a constituent of mine and um, has been fighting really hard to raise funds for a focused ultrasound scanner in Scotland. Um, Mary herself has suffered from, uh, suffers from essential tremor um, and while she suffered from this all her life, it was recent, quite recently that she was diagnosed. I think she was in her 40s before she was diagnosed with this. Um, she's been treated um, with deep brain stimulation, which is an invasive surgery where um, electrodes are placed in someone's brain and then... But the, they only last for so long, so you have to have repeat operations. Um, so that means that Mary wouldn't be eligible for treatment by the, the focused ultrasound scanner. So she herself wouldn't benefit from this, but having had the treatment herself and knowing that there is a non-invasive or a less invasive treatment available is very keen that other people should benefit from it. Um, now, <clears throat> She put, um, she contacted me and put me in touch with Dr. Tom Gilbertson um, from Nine Wells, and also um, he lectures in the University of Dundee, and they've been fundraising for uh, and for this to get a scanner in Scotland. There's only one in the UK, and that's in London, and there's a long waiting list for treatment there. Um, they, they're doing a lot of fundraising, and I had a members' debate on this and asked the Scottish government if they would look at 
providing some funding towards this. Now, the funding that was available from the Scottish Government was funding after the scanner was in place, so they would uh, fund some of the research that the scanner could do, because it's got much more potential than just um, essential tremor. It can, it can be used for a lot of treatments, and that's still being developed. Um, so really, I think Mary is keen that funding be found. That there is some funding in place already through fundraising, uh, but the sooner the money is available to get the scanner, the sooner it's in place, and the sooner it's available for people in Scotland um, to get treatment. Mary herself has to go to Newcastle for her treatment. Uh, and that means it, that's tough. You know, her, her partner, her husband has to go down with her. They need to find accommodation in Newcastle. You're getting literally brain surgery a long way from home, and that and that can be really difficult. So, uh, Mary is very keen that others with the same condition get better treatment closer to home. Am I right in saying, just to, to confirm from the petition, that the cost of a focus ultrasound scanner is ten thousand pounds? No. <laughs> no, no. I don't have the exact well, figure on front of me, yeah, but the, the, so your um, motion said purchase of a 1.5 million focus ultrasound device. So it looks like it could be one and a half million. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for <laughs> reminding me. I know it, it, it is into it is millions. It's very million. expensive, but it's still regarded as, in the longer term, a more cost-effective use and a better use for the better treatment for the patient. Better treatment for the patient, because if um, you have the deep brain um, stimulation, um, that means when you have invasive surgery and, that, and it's putting electrodes in your brain to stop the tremor, now they move in time, they, you know, so it's, it, when it's first done it's very effective, but over time they move, so then you have to go back and have more surgery. And with surgery, any invasive surgery, there's risk of infection, you know, apart from it being quite, I, I would suggest, frightening to have that kind of surgery. So if there was something that wasn't so invasive, I think, and is permanent, then, you know, people are treated and then they're fine. Any comments or suggestions for action, Rachel? Thank you, convener. Um, I think it's... Uh, quite poignant that the um, Imperial College Healthcare Trust are actually looking, um, following the results of the study, to actually work with NHS, in NHS England to make that treatment available. So um, I think it would be interesting to find out where the Scottish Government felt if it, if it was uh, about a monetary issue or whether it was about a commitment to actually making this available through all NHS um, boards in Scotland as well. Okay. Any others? Brian? I think, I think, I think for me, in a more general point, it strikes me this is another neurological condition that, that has been raised. With, you know, in muscular sclerosis has been raised, um, motor neuron disease has been raised. And I wonder, in a more general context here, um, whether there's something to look at here in the way in which, which uh, we are currently approaching uh, neurological conditions. Uh, because it seems to me that... Um, we're, we're, we're coming up a little bit short in, in that particular, in those particular conditions. So I, I don't know whether there is, a, there is a more general point to be made here. Well, there is. You make the more general point, but whether that would be something that this committee would be able to address, or whether it's something that can be flagged up elsewhere, I think that would be something we might want to reflect on. Um, David, I think she's actually right to the Scottish government and ask their views on what the petitioners call for. Um, I know so, exactly where the, the sit. Yeah, the right to the Scottish Government. I think there is an interesting issue here, and we maybe want to sort of just get an idea from the Scottish Government themselves what their uh, view is. Should we be contacting anyone else? Can I just mm -hmm. ask a question, convener? Sorry to interrupt. Um, it, it, the, the point that Rachel Hamilton made is a good one. It does say that the uh, Trust had a grant of a million pounds to purchase the equipment for the trial that they're doing. Um, but then it says that it's 1.5 million in um, Rhoda Grant's uh, motion for members to be. And I just wondered, are they different devices or but there seems to be a discrepancy in cost? They're, they're fundraising, so they have had some funding 
already, um, not from government but from other sources. And um, Mary Ramsey herself is doing is fundraising locally, and people who will benefit from this treatment are fundraising. Uh -huh. um, there is a gap. I'm not quite sure the size of this gap at the minute because obviously people are fundraising all the time. But there is a gap, and the scanner can't be purchased until that gap is closed. It might be worth um, the committee contacting um, Dr. Tom Gilbertson at NHS Teesside, yeah. who is at the forefront of this. Um, one, to find out maybe what the gap, the current gap in funding is, and two, to maybe get more information about the other benefits of this treatment if the scanner were bought, because it's not just essential tremor that it could be used for. And to have, you know, at Nine Wells, something that is kind of groundbreaking and I think would be prestigious for the whole of Scotland and prevent patients for, for having to travel south to get the treatment. Yes, then we agree to write the Scottish Government. We take up road suggestion and that perhaps the clerks can look at which would be the relevant stakeholder groups that might be able to um, assist in that. But we want to thank the petitioner for bringing this to our attention. Um, if we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1724 on Equal Rights for Commercial Attorneys and Party Litigants in the Legal System by Bill Alexander. The petitioner argues that commercial attorneys are not given rights equivalent to those of solicitors or advocates in the Scottish legal system. In advance of the consideration of this petition, the Lord President provided a written submission in response to the issues raised by the petitioner. In this submission, the Lord President confirms that, quote, there is no bias or prejudice against the Association of Commercial Attorneys or any of its members on the part of any judicial office holder. Any demonstration of bias or prejudice would constitute grounds for a complaint. There are complaints procedures available under the Complaints about the Judiciary Scotland Rules 2017. In response to the Lord President's submission, the petitioner highlights the challenges of making a complaint, a complaint about the Lord President and Chair as principal, particularly around the same time as the revised scheme for commercial attorneys was being considered. Both written submissions are included in our meeting papers, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, I think uh, it's a, it's a very interesting petition, I have to say, but I think in the, in the first instance we need to write to the key stakeholders, I would have thought. Um, certainly the Law Society, um, Faculty of Advocates, perhaps. Okay, anyone else? Convener, because the Lord President had um, given his submission, which um, had given the petitioner the opportunity to make um, complaints uh, through the complaints process and so I, I do think that there is a bit of a, a sort of a stalemate here that we need to probe a little bit more uh, with the Scottish Government to find out their views on it um, and not just um, make a judgment on what the Lord President had um, suggested his his views were. It may be that it's, some, it's simply something that's inside a system about people regarding are people equally valued and so on, and whether it's actually possible for us to be able to either make a judgment or that, or change the perception, mm -hmm. which some of it is about, and motive and so on, I think perhaps we want to reflect on, but I think it would be useful to gather a bit of evidence in order to do that. I agree. Okay, so we're agreeing to write the Scottish Government and again to identify key stakeholders um, in, in terms of just getting a response to both what the Lord President said and the further submission by the petitioner. Is that agreed? Okay, if we can then move on to the final new petition for consideration today, which is Petition 1725 on Suicide Awareness and Support for Young People by Anne-Marie Cocosa on behalf of families and friends affected by murder and suicide. The petition is calling for the Scottish Government to make suicide awareness, education, information and training mandatory for all high school pupils, teachers, carers and parents and to provide specific ring fence funding for this training. A spice briefing has been prepared in connection with this petition and is included in our papers. Um, I think one of the things I would want to say first of all is to thank the petitioners because obviously this comes from direct experience. Um, very difficult experience, but the way in which the petition has pr framed very positive suggestions and solutions, I think that is um, very helpful. 
and obviously we have our own uh, inquiry into mental health support and I think we might want to test some of these suggestions that are made in the petition in that inquiry because I think that idea of practical outcomes from this tragedy is really um, important and I think all of us have that sense if we were in those circumstances would we know what to say and perhaps something that you know you can see certainly when I was still teaching to have a bit of confidence to know what would be the right things to say and to be able to feel that you could at least help in some way I think is really important um, and I wonder whether people have suggestions that other than what I've just said, about what we could maybe do. Brian? Right, uh, thank you. I think, as you say, it's um, hugely emotive, and I think that it's a topic that has, has been uh, exercised in this parliament for a little while and, and, and actually um, continues to, to, to sort of gather information and momentum in terms of if it feels like we're going somewhere especially around the men, men, mental health. Um, and there are so many, there are so many strands, in, um, strands to this um, as well. So I think within the more general, uh, more general inquiry around mental health services, this is, um, I was going to say uh, uh, welcome. I think that's, not, that's the wrong word, obviously. But it certainly adds to uh, some of the inquiries that we're currently doing. Um, and uh, as you suggest, I think, uh, some of the suggestions you have there that, 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 that we bring that into the mental health inquiry would be very useful. We would hope the petitioners would be able to engage with in, inquiry as, as we're going forward. Um, I suppose, we, I mean, it, as usual, it would be sensible to write to the Scottish Government seeking its views on the action called from the petition because there are very practical things that are suggested there, but also to looking at how we can uh, sort of ensure this petition and its suggestions are part of our inquiry. Mm -hmm. And we will be getting more detail on that at a later stage. Yeah. Is that agreed? Yeah. OK. And again, to thank the petitioners for bringing that to your attention. Can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow witnesses for the next agenda item to join the table? Um, call the meeting back to order and if we can move on now to the next item on our agenda which is the consideration of continued petitions the first continued petition for consideration is petition 1596 by Paul Anderson on in care survivor service Scotland the note by the clerk summarizes our last consideration of this petition in June 2019 at which we took evidence from future pathways as well as recent written submissions received from future pathways and the petitioner this morning, uh, we will take evidence from representatives from Wellbeing Scotland. Can I welcome Janine Rennie and David Scott to the meeting, and can I thank you for attending this morning. Um, you have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'll give a, a start to our statement, and then David will follow on from me, but we should keep within five minutes. Uh, Wellbeing Scotland have over 25 years of experience in supporting survivors of historic child abuse. Uh, we have a deep understanding of complex trauma and how it differs from conditions such as PTSD and the challenges it present in respect of treatment and support for survivors of historic child abuse. We're COSCA recognised as an organisation and we consistently have uh, high scores from clients in terms of feedback. We created and developed the In Care Survivors Service Scotland 11 years ago and until the creation of Future Pathways, that was the bedrock upon which support services for survivors of historic abuse was based. Um, Future Pathways, we know, are only three years old as a service, with limited experience of working with abuse at all. There are today a large number of organisations offering a wide range of support uh, services to survivors, and we think that's no bad thing. But no other service has been working in the field for anywhere near to the time that Wellbeing Scotland have in the interests of survivors. No service has our pedigree, experience or knowledge. 
the landscape of support survivors is the same as it was when ICSS started, um, and 2,500 uh, so chose the in care survivor service uh, and have reported that the current system is confusing and distressing. An evaluation by Napier University in 2011 provided evidence that ICSS model was the one preferred by survivors because we offer counselling, advocacy, informal support groups, helpline and access to records all in one service. And that was an aspect that was highly valued by survivors and recommended actually from the Tom Shaw report at that time. Uh, and that is the main issue for the petitioner, that he's able to access those services all under one roof. Clients did not wish to access NHS services in many cases due to the clinical approach and the lack of understanding of the needs of survivors of complex trauma. Survivors do not identify with mental health services and the approaches used by them, and that has been the significant concern that's been highlighted by the petitioner. Only 30% of survivors have been diagnosed with mental illness. With our vast experience, we perceive there are several issues that the committee should explore. They are Future Pathways is the only gatekeeper organisation and therefore the complete lack of flexibility within the system. Survivors have to register with Future Pathways to access the support fund. They are then being directed to a range of other providers to the exclusion of Wellbeing Scotland. Those seeking counselling are required to attend an assessment with the anchor, even those who are already attending in-care survivors and our, all of our workers have experienced that happening. Um, apparent lack of understanding of the academic research into the diagnosis and treatment of complex trauma and how that differs from complex PTSD and other conditions, and the continued refusal or unwillingness to refer to Wellbeing Scotland. Future Pathways submission has many inaccuracies, and I've provided um, evidence to the committee about that. The organisation is costing the Scottish Purse over 1.4 million per annum and staff costs alone to broker other services. Survivors have proven that they are able to choose the support of, uh, of a, without the support of a support coordinator. The associated cost of this additional layer reduces the level of funds which is available directly to survivors. We feel Wellbeing Scotland are a vital service for in-care survivors going forward, particularly with the redress scheme approaching. However, by blocking referrals, future pathways will potentially shrink our service and we will lose key staff. We will have no confirmation of funding after March 2020. Wellbeing Scotland are a cost-effective service with a lower unit cost than all other providers, with a service satisfaction level reported as highly satisfied by 97% of survivors. I'll just hand over to David. Uh, placing uh, future pathways, uh, a new and hitherto untried organisation, with a new model of delivery, uh, the broker model, in the lead role, coordinating the funding for the majority of the existing uh, infrastructure of support for survivors in, of in-care abuse has been a serious strategic error. Its decision-making in connection with Wellbeing Scotland and the valued and successful in-care survivor Scotland service has been deficient and harmful, illustrating the short-sightedness of the choice to place so much authority in an organisation struggling to find its feet and its place in this most challenging field. The dedicated staff at Wellbeing Scotland want to do their jobs, and their jobs help people who have been let down by those they should have been able to trust. Those people who have survived abuse have made such personal strides forward with the help of Wellbeing Scotland that their personal stories, achievements and victories constitute an inspiration and an example of what can be achieved. Neither those survivors nor our staff can understand why Future Pathways is placing barriers in the way of this service and these personal victories. So I'm going to open it up yeah, to questions now. I suppose my sense is what we're interested in is not so much, it's not really a funding argument between Wellbeing Scotland and other organisations, but it's trying to understand has have, what's been put in place meant that the kinds of support that a lot of survivors would want and need is no longer available and you happen to provide that kind of service and that's maybe something we could um, explore with you just to try and understand what the different model is and, and I think you've, you've highlighted quite a lot of it in your initial contribution. Can I um, maybe just start off by saying um, it's clear from your written submissions and from the evidence that we've heard from Future Pathways that the relationship between Wellbeing Scotland and Future Pathways is not a positive one. 
and you have said that you have not had referrals and so on. I understand that a meeting between the two organisations took place on the 5th of August. And in the submission of 16th of August, Future Pathway stated that as a result, they hope that a stable contractual arrangement can be in place by mid-September to formalise future referrals. Can I ask you to comment on that? And do you feel that there is a more positive working relationship with Future Pathways now? To answer, yeah. Um... The, the meeting was very positive in that it, it developed um, improved communication between members of our board and organisation and um, future pathways. Um, but it didn't really resolve the significant or weighty issues that we brought forward. On the contract, uh, the specific of the case of the contract, this is something that has been discussed for some two years. Uh, the lack of referrals to Wellbeing Scotland was, was placed at the, uh, by Future Pathways um, as a consequence of not having a contract in place. And it was made quite clear to us that there would be no referrals until we had signed a contract. Now, we've never seen a contract. We've had no draft, we've had no heads of agreement. There's, there's not been anything provided. And uh, we pushed very hard at the meeting to, to have something in, in paper that we could assess to move the thing forward. Uh, we were told that this would be provided in two weeks, but that deadline has unfortunately come and gone, and we've still not seen anything by way of a contract. So we've not really turned the corner on this. And until we see what's in this contract, and we, we're completely in the dark over this, we won't know if we are about to move into a new era of cooperation or, or not. It's... Um, it's, it's, it's quite mystifying to us as to why, after so long, we still don't know what we're being asked to sign up for. A sense of what it is in the contract that they think you might have a problem with? Certainly one of our main issues with uh, the original Future Pathways contract that was given out to providers was that they were asking us really to breach client confidentiality. Um, we want, they wanted individual agreements for each client was really identified who those clients were, but not only that, what the significant issues that clients brought were. So we were tense about that. So we sent out a, a document to the survivors that we worked with to see if they were okay to give us permission to share that information. And particularly under GDPR, you ha clients have to give informed consent. Um, so the clients, up to about 80% of the clients responded and said, no, we absolutely do not want that information shared. Bearing in mind this is in a sort of context where a lot of the survivors of abuse and care who came to us didn't want to even give us their real name when they initially came along. They were so distrusting of the state and so, so challenged by sharing any information at all that they were now being asked that the intimate details of their care was then going to be shared with another organisation that they didn't know. Um, and even when they did know them, they still didn't want to share the, the, the information. So. We were going by the views of our clients and what we reported to Future Pathways at that board meeting was we're surprised that any provider signed up to this contract because we're not sure that clients have in any way given informed consent to sign up. Um, and we're actually making that decision for our clients and I'm not comfortable with that, that we would make that decision for them to pass on what's highly sensitive information to an organisation that, as David says, is only three years in operation and finding its feet. Um, whereas originally they were very tense about even providing any information to us as an established service. Do you think there's an issue of trust here? In the past, presumably, you reported on the level of support you were offering to your funders. So the Scottish Government, whatever you say, we're dealing with X number of people, and that was regarded as sufficient information. I'm just wondering whether it is, that, is there a suggestion that Future Pathways is has some lack of confidence in what you're actually delivering? Well, that was a, a big concern of ours as to why they would. We've worked with the Scottish Government for 10 years and the uh, Scottish Government were really happy with the reports that we provided. They were based on amalgamated core scores um, and, you know, that's a clinical tool. It's well recognised. So we provided that to the Scottish Government for the past 10 years and they've been very happy with that. 
So our board's concern was that future pathways were almost saying that we were untrustworthy and that they wanted more than that in terms of the individual information. Whereas the information that we provided before was fine, but we were surprised at committee that the NHS Anchor Centre actually confirmed that they don't have to provide individualised information. Their information is all compiled the same way we used to do with the Scottish Government. So we don't understand why this has presented a barrier or why there's an issue. Um, we've gone over and over it, unfortunately. Uh, Gail Ross. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Janine, David. Um, I just want to um, try and get to the bottom of the waiting list. Um, in your written submission of the 21st of June, you referred to the futures, future pathways waiting list as being dangerously long. And then in their written submission of the 16th of August, they state that they've now eliminated the waiting list. I note that in your recent submission, just in the last couple of days to us, um, you also mention about the um, 940, 271 were referred by Wellbeing Scotland and that they state 95 in the paper, which is incorrect. Could you maybe go into that a little bit more? Well, we, we're aware that Future Pathways waiting list has been eradicated because they doubled their staff members. So that was one of the things that we raised in the, the document where... Uh, their staff salaries have doubled to 1.4 million now. They recruited another group of coordinators to meet that demand in terms of uh, people coming forward. We'd said all along that we were willing to take referrals directly, so we could have eradicated the waiting list with our low level of funding, but instead the decision was taken to recruit a, a higher level of staff. And... Um, the inaccuracies, when I really examined their submission, I realised that they were given figures up to 2018, where other figures in the document were up to 2019, so it was an inconsistency. So our figures as they stand at the date where I presented my paper were the ones that I've presented in terms of up to March 2019. So in your, um, in your knowledge, have they actually eradicated their waiting list then? I don't know, to be honest. Okay. Uh, that would be for future pathways to know. But from our point of view, survivors certainly, I would say, are being seen much more quickly than they were originally. Some are now able to access the support fund over the phone rather than having to wait and see a support coordinator. So there certainly have been steps forward in terms of um, people were waiting before that for about a year and a half. So now people are being seen much more quickly. Um, but again, it's not the system's changed a bit. It's not before somebody had to see a support coordinator, they had to spend a substantial amount of time building a relationship and then they would decide what the personal outcome was that the person was wanting to achieve. Now it seems to be that our clients are reporting that they basically tell the personal outcome coordinator what it is they want to achieve and they get that, or it's turned down by committee. It seems to just go straight to committee Whereas we said that was a missed opportunity because our workers know our clients really, really well. And we could actually have sat down with our clients and, you know, our clients could have spoken to us about what they want to achieve. They'll have that idea in their heads themselves. So Future Pathways now seem to have accepted that, sur that survivors can make that decision for themselves. But essentially that could have happened a long time ago and we wouldn't have had the, the state that we're in just now where some survivors have become quite unwell, actually, with the waiting process after already having disclosed what, what happened to them. Instead of recruiting all the extra staff, there was another way that they could have done it, but still kept a level of service that they were given to survivors, and that would have been by using yourselves. Yeah, we had the capacity to take the survivors, and we said that all along. And, um, you know, I've made it very, very clear to Flora that we were really keen to work constructively with Future Pathways. We don't want to say that we want Future Pathways to go as a service because it's offering practical support to survivors, which is something we as a service don't want to do. Um, we think that's for a role for another organisation. But rather than let us help, there's been barriers put up. And we don't know, David and I had a discussion the other night, we don't know what that's about. We can't understand it. Uh, because we've been there so long, we've built up a trusting relationship with Scottish Government. And Scottish Government have been quite helpful in some of this process. So uh, the difficulty is uh, we don't know why there are still blocks when we didn't need to spend more of what is in effect the survivor's own money on salary costs when that could have been achieved by the organisations already there. Okay, thanks. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. 
think one of, one of the one of the issues we have to explore here is, is the disparity in, 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 in the evidence we're receiving from, from both sides. And if I could specifically look at referrals, you've previously stated to the committee that um, Future Pathways have made less than 10 referrals uh, to Wellbeing Scotland since they started in September 2016. But during our evidence session with Future Pathways just in June, um, they confirmed to us that they've made 35 re referrals for records searches and funded the su support of 192 people, in addition to 134 people who were supported to ensure that their support was not disrupted. And are, these, are these figures that, that you recognise uh, and can confirm? Um, the figures are actually the figures of the ongoing clients. The Scottish Government made a commitment when uh, Future Pathways came into being that our existing clients would continue to be supported by us and Future Pathways would pay for that. So they weren't new referrals. They were uh, referrals that we already had who then moved over to be part of the Future Pathways umbrella. And the 35 referrals for access to records, that's not something that Future Pathways essentially themselves chose to do. That was a directive by the Scottish Government that because we were specialists in access to records, that those referrals would come to us. And that was actually on the Scottish Government's own website that we would receive the access to records referrals. So we, we are now up to 50 access to records referrals, but we still haven't received any referrals for counselling support. And on the access to records referrals, it actually states only to offer support for access to records and nothing else, which is a real concern because survivors who come along to access their records may access something that's quite disturbing to them. They might see something that's quite re-traumatising. So it's very important as part of that process that they have counselling support alongside it to ensure that, you know, the counsellor's there to, to be with them. Um, so that's, that's again, but, so we're still in a scenario where, and Flora herself confirmed at the board meeting that we had recently, that they haven't been making referrals. So uh, she contradicted, as I would say, her own, her own submission then, because she confirmed to her own committee that she hadn't been making referrals. And it, it was quite clear, no contract, no referrals. And there's no contract because we haven't seen one yet. And the issue there appears to be uh, information flow and reporting back to future pathways. And this was one of the strange aspects of the meeting. We, we were reaching agreement with the board of future pathways, but the chief executive kept bringing it back to being a problem, needing more information, much more specific information about our clients, uh, information that we feel breaches confidentiality. This is not information that would have been sought in the past when people were referred to Wellbeing Scotland. There was a kind of an accepted way of recording the number of clients you were dealing with that was acceptable to the Scottish Government? It was acceptable to the Scottish Government. Scottish Government were always really happy with the information that we provided. Um, and we actually went through recently an audit by the Scottish Government. But after all of this and me feeling that we weren't being trusted as an organisation, we invited the Scottish Government to come in and do an audit of our files. Uh, she signed a confidentiality agreement and she carried out an audit of our files and found everything, everything to be absolutely above board and fine. So we've never had an issue with Scottish Government and our reporting mechanisms. So um, this is why we find this so confusing. Right. Just my, my thought off the back of that. I mean, if you're, if you're already working with a client, it can hardly then be classed as a referral. So I think that, that's something we're going to have to check if that if that if that's correct i mean one thing i'll just just add to that is that future pathways would claim that the disparity in the figures is uh, around lack of sharing of information between the two organizations um would you agree with that is that something we would as, uh, when we make a referral to future pathways um they then record that on their communication system and generally our worker will phone with the client to support them. Um, one of the issues we've had, unfortunately, is when the first meeting's been set up with the client, the Future Pathways worker has very much tried to discourage the client from having their Wellbeing Scotland worker with them. And that's something clients have found really upsetting. Um, and they've, they've actually blatantly said, you know, don't have your Wellbeing, worker, uh, Wellbeing Scotland worker here. So, uh, but we certainly are being very clear about the clients that we've actually been referring. And I actually submitted a report to Flora on our main spreadsheet, which actually highlighted in a column at the end the number of clients that had been referred. So she has yes. that in writing. How many clients have you referred? 
how many clients we've referred to to yeah. future pathways. Yeah. How many? Do you know? Uh, so up to date, I would say probably about 350. Um, because we really we wanted to make sure that our clients had the range of supports that were available to them. So the only clients that we've not referred are those who have absolutely said, no, they do not want to be referred to Future Pathways. Uh, I've no interest in the support fund. So they're the only clients that we've not referred. Any clients who have said that they want access to the support fund, we absolutely say the support fund is something they have an absolute human right to and they, we feel that they should be able to access. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Good morning. Um, your, your knowledge in your submission of April 2018, many survivors have benefited greatly from accessing the additional support offered by Future Pathways. However, in the petitioner's experience, this new model has been significantly disruptive and unsettling. Are you able to give the committee an indication as to how many survivors are in this situation? Majority of survivors. Uh, one of the things that came across when we did our evaluation of the Incare Survivor Service in 2011 was that they didn't want to keep telling their, their story to people over and over and over again. They wanted everything under one roof, and that's what Tom Shaw's report came up with, that everything was to be a, a sort of one-stop shop where somebody came along and their needs were met, which is why we had people who could be counsellors and advocates and group workers. Uh, survivors are coming to us. We had one survivor who said that she'd actually been referred to five different services by Future Pathways and she was getting really distressed and upset and losing track of when all these appointments were, who she'd told what, uh, what she hadn't communicated. And uh, the survivor was saying this is incredibly distressing and a lot of the people that we're working with, we've had a number of client meetings where there's been about 80 survivors attended and they're saying that one of the most confusing things is well, you know, my support coordinator is saying if I, if I have to have advocacy, I've got to go here, or, but I'm already getting that from you. And if I want counselling, I've got to go to this private counsellor, but are you not already offering me counselling? And the confusion is getting really... And even people who are coming to us new, like, from, you know, self-referring themselves, they're saying that the whole landscape now for survivors is becoming incredibly confusing. There's so many places... I'm not saying it's a bad thing. There's so many places for them now to go. But my argument was... Those places were always there. The reason that the Scottish Government and Tom Shaw's report decided that there needed to be a specialist service that provided survivors all of those needs to be met under one umbrella was because they found it incredibly re-traumatising every time they had to tell somebody what happened to them. And if you imagine that from... We, we use this in our training and we say, would you go and tell somebody every intimate detail of your life? Would you even tell your GP that? Would you be comfortable? So how is it okay for somebody who's suffered significant trauma to actually go and have to tell people every aspect of their life? And clients say they find that incredibly humiliating and demeaning, that they have to do that in order, and particularly in order to have some sort of financial reward. They find that extremely demeaning. So I have strong concerns about it, and I raised it before the model even came about because I said, you know, essentially clients are now going to feel like they're going out with a begging bowl. And that's what they all report to us. And they're also not, they're going to be in a deep confusion as to where they're going to go. And they're being sent here, there and everywhere. And then coming back to us, extremely distressed. Some of the survivors who were told to disengage because they were going to another counsellor have then come back in a suicidal state where we've had people who have been stable for, for years. And I mean, that's another issue. We offer sort of lifelong support because if people need it, because the client group that we're working with have suffered significant and severe complex trauma and there still isn't a really good understanding in Scotland and the UK about the impact of complex trauma and how that can affect every aspect of somebody's life. So if, you, if all of you in the committee imagine how it would feel if you had to go with a very intimate issue to your GP and then you felt that your GP was sending you here, there and everywhere and you had to tell that story over and over again, how would that feel? And that's what the survivors have been put into. Mm -hmm. uh, morning. Morning. Um, now, I want to explore um, the area that you're talking about there, about the contract and, and about the data sharing, the lack of information flow, um, where it looks like future pathways need more information. Um, in a submission on the 16th of August, Future Pathways said, and I quote, Wellbeing Scotland is the only support provider out of 70 not to sign up to the quality. 
common quality standards and reporting requirements, and that they say that these standards and requirements were informed by typical NHS contract requirements. Um, other than the issue about the data sharing, um, can you provide a little bit more information about um, why providing some of the information that they expect you to provide is problematic, and is that what is holding up the issuing of the contract? Really, no. The, it was a strange subject discussion in the meeting we had with, the, with their board, because we outlined all of the problems to do with confidentiality and consent, and we outlined what we could do. And there was immediate agreement. Right? The board of Future Pathways seemed quite comfortable with what we were saying. And then a few minutes later, the chief executive raised a problem with insufficient information again, and the conversation went another loop round. We did this about four times. So we thought we walked away with agreement as to what we were going to provide, which is anonymised data so that Future Pathways can understand how many services we're providing, how many people we're providing services to in, in various categories, and have a, um, a management level information so that they can understand what our capability, resource and availability is. There's no problem with any of that. But repeatedly, we were then told by Flora Henderson that that wasn't enough, and then she would go into um, requiring details so that they could assess each individual person to make sure there wasn't some sort of duplication of effort. And, and it, it hugely breached what we would feel to be appropriate in terms of respecting the confidentiality of our clients and the right to voluntarily informed um, express consent. I understand that um, Future Pathways also say that um, there's a lack of transparency and they're looking to uh, established that you are providing value for money as part of that. Uh, so how is it that the other providers are able to meet those contract requirements, um, including, of course, the sharing of information, in particular, you know, um, overcoming that data protection and, and uh, GDPR in order to prove that they are providing a transparent uh, service and value for money? What, what is it that's different between Wellbeing Scotland and the other providers? Providers have already, they've initially taken the referral from Future Pathways. So that consent's already been agreed between the Future Pathways coordinator, the survivor and the new support organisation. So essentially because we've not had any referrals, we've not been in that process. So it would be that um, if a survivor came to us tomorrow from Future Pathways and the Future Pathways coordinator had already gained that informed consent, then obviously, of course, there would be sharing of information because the survivor would have already known what information was going to be shared, who it was going to be shared with, what the, limit of, the limits of the information that had been shared, and they would have been able to make that decision. So other providers are coming in in a completely different way. They're coming in with referrals from Future Pathways the survivors we are working with are already working with us, and Future Pathways is the new organisation. And as I said, a lot of them don't want to sign up to Future Pathways uh, reporting requirements. That, so can there be an exemption, or have you discussed that with regards to that particular aspect about that data sharing and the, um, the, 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 the clients that you are, have been working with, those survivors that do not want to share their information? Scottish Government have agreed, yes, that there should be. Uh, but as David said, Flora Henderson said no. So um, Scottish Government have been comfortable with what we've provided. And we have a block grant from Scottish Government and they've been happy for the information. They've given us a reporting requirement that's really accessible, it's, it's really appropriate. Um, so what we don't understand is why Scottish Government find that appropriate, but Future Pathways don't for those survivors. Um, I've got another uh, question. Um, given that Future Pathways has undertaken to ensure that continued support is available, and in its evidence also said that support is not time limited, does Wellbeing Scotland have a long term commitment from Future Pathways to provide support to people who are uncomfortable in engaging uh, with Future Pathways? 
they don't. They said to us that everybody had, there's been lots of arguments back and forth about this. Uh, they have said that survivors have to be signed up to Future Pathways for them to continue to give support in the longer term. Um, and that's becoming a real barrier for the survivors that we work with who really don't want to sign up to Future Pathways. They don't want to access the support fund and really they don't want any more intervention. So that's been really challenging for them um, in terms of the block is that Future Pathways have said in the longer term they want every one of those survivors to be signed up to Future Pathways. And again, that seems to be taking choice away from the survivors that we're working with. They're not getting that choice. They're more or less being told if you want to access services anymore, you have to be signed up to Future Pathways. So uh, I really argued that point and said, you know, people need to have choice. And if they don't want to be registered with an organisation that essentially a lot of them perceive as a government organisation, then they shouldn't be forced to do so. Um, the, the whole agenda years ago, when, uh, like I say, at the time of the uh, the reference group who decided there was a need for a service for survivors, it was to ensure that they could feel safe and confidential and that um, you know their, their information wasn't going to be shared in a number of different ways. And a lot of the survivors we are working with are really, really concerned that that uh, stability is not there anymore. So you consider that this is a barrier to a person-centred approach? Absolutely. It's not a person-centred approach. And uh, that was kind of my major concern. It's a service-led approach. It's not a person-centred approach. And uh, the personal outcomes conversations are things that clients find incredibly demeaning. Um, I mean, again, I'll put it back to you all. How would you feel if you went along to somebody and they had a debate with you about whether you needed a fridge or whether you needed a carpet for your home? Uh, you're a human being. You've got the capacity to decide whether you, whatever you need for your life. You don't need somebody to sit and have a personal outcomes conversation with you to decide what it is that you need. So there's a, in a lot of ways we've gone really backwards. To me, it's a, um, a breach of... Um, human rights in terms of mental well-being and mental health and uh, that we're being perceiving that somebody who's been a victim of complex trauma can't make their own decisions. Just one question, Kavina, please. So do you believe that the requirements for the contract don't meet a person-centred approach? They don't. I mean, to be person-centred, it would be what the clients decided would be an appropriate contract. And when we put the contract out to the clients, we showed them what the contract was for each individual. I have to say the clients were horrified. I mean, I'm not saying all. Some clients were quite happy for that information to be shared around 20%. But 80% of clients were coming back and a lot of them were getting really upset with our service because they felt as if we were colluding with it uh, by even putting out that question. And that's, that's another concern that we've had. Survivors who have been stable and really okay for a number of years are now starting to feel really chaotic. And a lot of that is around the issues of all the different... If, if you imagine that you're, you're coming to a level of stability and then there's all these different questions being asked of you, then it's confusing. It's re-traumatising. Even the amount of evaluations we're doing of everybody is re-traumatising. As if we're seeing somebody as an object on a bit of paper rather than a human being. That, um, you know, our core processes are part of the therapeutic work we do with clients because they like to see the distance travelled. So they like to see, well, if I came in in session one, my relationships were terrible or I felt suicidal. Oh, in session 12, I'm feeling a lot better now. I've reduced down from most of the time to sometimes. I've made progress. It's part of the therapeutic process. It's not just so that we can tick a box and have an evaluation. And those are, that's the data that I can amalgamate and show really significant results from. And that can be audited if need be. But, you know, the individual data... Why does anybody need to know that somebody came in and they were having a terrible relationship with their family? They were really struggling with the issues of their abuse and care. So the personal outcomes we put in place are that we're going to offer a session of counselling and then we'll come back 12 sessions later and say, does the person still have issues with their family? How is it MD's human right to know what their family is like? You know, unless they choose to share that. It's, uh, or any of the other personal information that they might feel compelled that they have to share. I feel really uh, quite distressed by this because they're, people, they're human beings that we've worked with for 11 years now who are now feeling that they're being forced into a system that maybe some of them are not ready for. 
And I'm not saying everybody, somebody might, we have a client who had a really good experience with Future Pathways, an excellent experience from start to finish. So I'm not saying it's everybody. And this model could work if we took away a lot of the things that are really demeaning and demoralising to clients. And we actually trusted services like Wellbeing Scotland who understand complex trauma, who understand the client needs. Let us softly and gently take somebody through to the process of being registered. If they then want to access the support, rather than firing them into a situation where they have to be registered, they're being asked to share information that, I mean, one of our clients um, actually only gave a first name for two years. And that wasn't even his real first name. So, all of, and it's because the state abused the individuals that we work with. Uh, that's the way they perceive it. So they find it really demoralising to have to go through a situation of being cap in hand to the state. Um, so they need the support of services. Like I've always said, if our service wasn't needed, I'd be delighted because it would mean that there was recovery. That would be an achievement if our service wasn't needed anymore. And we would have walked away like when Future Pathways come into being if we felt that was the right way forward for survivors. But we feel we need to hang on in there and fight and campaign to remain as a service because people still need us. And we will still fight and campaign until the time that they don't. But we're now in a situation where Scottish Government come back to us saying they don't know about our funding on from 2020. And yet they were able to confirm funding for Future Pathways to 2021, a service where we have found there have been significant difficulties and they themselves have admitted there have been significant difficulties in them finding their feet. So... What you're doing is throwing out a service that's got 11 years experience, bringing in a new untested service that doesn't have the experience. And, uh, you know, basically we are the ones, our chair raised with their chair. Why are we in a, you know, a, a kind of demeaning relationship ourselves with Future Pathways? It's been modelled in our own service. And our workers have had to hang on in there for the last three years, not knowing if they're going to have a job because they care about their clients. We would really come to the end of the time that we have for this petition, but um, I suppose just to confirm, you do think there's a role for future pathways. You accept the Scottish Government has seen your model as being one that was important in the past, and you're concerned about that, but it's not that they should be in competition with each other. Can I ask, David, what is it that the Board is, would want to see happen specifically around the contracts and so on? I mean, I think there's a deeper question about how we actually support survivors and understand what their needs are and a non-medical model and all of those kinds of things, which are really important. And you'd be worried that the Scottish Government's investing a lot of money in this and you'd be worried that they're investing in a new model mm -hmm. and getting rid of a model that has been proven to be effective. And that's something we can explore with them. But in terms of, because we don't want to personalise it to any individual, what would you, what would you as a board be looking for from Future Pathways? want the barriers to disappear. The board feel the frustration that Janine describes and that our, our workers report that the job that they want to do, the job that they are excellent at, the job that's working, is being hindered. And we can't see any, any satisfactory reason why. We, we think the problems are entirely solvable, that, that should have been solved years ago, that should be solved because it's obvious that they need to be solved. We can't see what's driving this. We've got skills and experience and we're a centre of excellence of national importance. We, ex we would expect any organisation with a coordinating role to frankly work us to the very limit of our capacity. And, and the reverse is happening. Thanks very much for that. I think in terms of taking this forward, one of the things we do want to do, and we'll think about how it's done, which is to have an opportunity to hear what the petitioner now feels. Now, we understand the challenges and, and uh, the courage the petitioners already displays in bringing a petition forward, so we will continue to have that conversation about how we get that response back. We obviously would want to hear from Future Pathways responding to this session. Um, I wonder from other committee members if they think about what else we could be doing. Yeah. Brian? Thank you, Fina. I, I find it very strange that this has um, ended up within the Petitions Committee. We've got you know, two organisations that can't find common ground. We're giving us 
disparity of evidence and delivering it uh, as fact. And at the end of the day, the work, both organisations are supposed to be working with some of the most vulnerable people in society. Um, so the outcomes for me, uh, the, the losers, are inevitably going to be uh, the service users. So, as I say, I, I find it very strange that this, this is required to come into the Petitions Committee. For me, I think what we should be doing, given that uh, it's, it's being funded through the Scottish Government, uh, is that we should be taking evidence from the Scottish Government because it's them that are, that are, that are uh, paying for these services and both organisations suggesting that they have the support of the Scottish Government. So I, I think we should bring the Scottish Government in as soon as we can and, and, and ask them their opinion and their evidence what they think is supposed to be happening. This is a change of model and the question is whether Future Pathways actually regards itself as a gatekeeper or a partner. And whether in, in changing that model, they've actually, what was already been done by Wellbeing Scotland, this is what the petitioner suggests, their role is now being reduced. And I think that's something, I think I would agree with you that we want to take um, evidence from the Scottish Government uh, you know, in, in consideration of this petition. Anything else we could do? Uh, Brian just said, and I think it's important to establish if the contract requirements are actually suitable for a person-centred approach in this situation. Oh, other area, isn't there, about non-medical um, interventions or medical... I think it's in the paperwork suggestion that one of the issues is a desire to medicalise this problem when, in fact, people are not ill, they're traumatised. Mm -hmm. Some will be also be ill, but very often it's simply... And that lack of trust, I think, that um, has to be at the heart of it, that sense you're dealing with people who have already been betrayed. I'm sure I'm not the only person here who deals with folk who are survivors and simply don't give you their names. And you, you almost have to kind of... And a lot of anger, which is also um, understandable. However, I think there's quite a lot there that we can we can take forward. Can I thank you very much for your attendance today? I think that's been very helpful. And obviously, as we, as we progress, you will get an opportunity to comment on future evidence that has been presented as well. Um, so can I thank you very much? And can I suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave?
Um, call the meeting back to order, especially those who are not members of the committee. Thank you. Um, our next continued petition is petition 1517 on polypropylene mesh, medical devices by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy. We last considered this petition in June 2018. Since then, the committee published its report in August 2018, to which the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing responded in June of this year. In this response, the Cabinet Secretary outlined the actions that the Scottish Government has taken relevant to the issues raised in this petition. The petitioners have recently provided a written submission in response to the Cabinet Secretary's letter, and that's included in our papers. The petitioner's submission acknowledges that significant progress has been made by the petition, including suspension of the use of polypropylene transvaginal mesh TVM procedures, mandatory reporting of all adverse incidents by health professionals, and the establishment of a national complex case review unit. The petitioner's submission also raises some concerns, particularly with regard to plans to reintroduce use of um, TVM procedures and the establishment of a national complex review unit within NHS Scotland rather than NHS Lothian, as the petitioners requested. The petitioners have contacted the clerks to highlight an important point that they feel has been missed in our meeting papers in that they have more confidence in the clinicians within NHS Lothian than those in other NHS boards. That's not to say that they have full confidence in any Scottish-based clinician based on their experiences. And can I welcome um, Neil Finlay at this point? I know he's had a long-standing interest in this petition. It might be helpful to us if you want to maybe make a contribution at this point in order to... Just very briefly, committee. I don't want to take up too much of the committee's time, but um, I noticed in the committee papers there was a reference to um, the Scottish Government's um, approach uh, to Dr Veronica's um, US surgeon to come uh, to Scotland. Um, I think it would be very worthwhile the committee um, taking some evidence from the Scottish Government and from Dr Veronica himself um, as to what progress has been made on that. Um, I have made some inquiries, but it's been quite difficult to um, find out which progress has been made. So I would um, urge the committee to do that so that we can get a, a full update as to um, what progress, if any, has been made. That's in the first instance we can simply write to the Scottish Government and ask for an update, and then we can certainly share that with the petitioners, because I think this is something that's been ongoing, this means a suggestion that the, the, um, Dr Veronica has been involved, but I think others are more sceptical than that. Uh, I think if the committee's going to write, it might be worth writing to both parties. OK. Um, anyone else have a comment at this stage? It just feel to me that this is still something where the lack of confidence of the petitioners and what the Scottish Government is doing is quite um, marked, and I think certainly not helped by the suggestion in the paperwork that the Chief Medical Officer may be continuing to explore when this procedure could be reintroduced. They're waiting on to see what happens in England and Wales, but uh, um, uh, and that there was a possible move by NICE to reintroduce mesh in England and Wales, but the government review under Baroness Cumberbatch, uh, she stepped in and said nothing should be done until her, she can completes her review. So, um, yeah, I think there's real concern about that. But um, given that uh, the offer was made uh, for the doctor to come here last November, and we're heading for November again, and, you know, we don't see anything happen. And in the interim, uh, women are having to crowdfund and rely on benefactors to go to America to have removal, I think is um, something worth investigating by the committee. OK. Brian? Um, you know, I think we, we, we all know how harrowing uh, this has been, and I've only been involved in it for the last sort of three years. Um, I'm with you in, on this one, convener, and it, it, I find it strange uh, that we're still in a situation where, um, even though there's a, I think there's a huge amount of progress being made, there's still not confidence in, uh, in, in what the, the, the Scottish Government have done to date. Um, I've got to say I, I agree with uh, my colleague, Mr Finlay, in terms of that I think that's an area we really should be exploring. It's, it's certainly not something that, that we, can, we can tie off at the moment. I think we've got to keep keep uh, pushing this one. Okay, any other comments? No, I th think we are then agreeing to um, contact the Scottish Government direct directly to them on this issue of the role of Dr Veronica's, 
on the question of the concerns raised by the petitioner about the actual issue of long-term suspension um, of TVM, but also what work has been done to support women who are needing um, uh, reversal um, and what kind of pathway there is for uh, mesh injured women in Scotland. Because again, I think that's something that's quite, um, does come out in the evidence, Mr Finlay. You said you write the Scottish Government, but we'll also write to the other party involved as well. Yeah, um, and um, in terms of the uh, pathways available and the what what has been done in Scotland, um, I think it's absolutely imperative that we hear from patients because their view of what is offered during that pathway um, and what is presented as being offered is very different, very different indeed. In so, for example, give an example, the, there is a view that uh, from the clinicians that full mesh removal is available in Scotland. The view from patients is it is not. Okay, I mean, certainly in terms of the Public Petitions Committee, um, anyone has the opportunity to, to provide a submission when they've heard evidence. And the only issue I would raise is a question of timing. It's whether we want to get the Scottish Government's response and then get the petitioners then to, to respond to that. But of course, that would not prohibit them from at any point giving evidence of the direct experience that they'll have been hearing from from um, fellow sufferers. And I think but you know, we're not blocking any information. We need to think about how we make sure that people have that full information, we would hope that people would do that. But I think we're agreed as a committee that this is still something Absolutely. that there are, there continue to be more questions than answers and the, the level of concern from the petitioners and that sense um, of not really having much confidence in anybody, but even within the system, um, they have more confidence in NHS Lothian and other boards. These are things that can't go away and I'm sure the Scottish Government would want to address them. So I think um, it's clear then that we want to this forward and, of course, the petitioners and others who might want to respond will have the opportunity to do so. Um, and with that, can I thank Neil Finlay for his attendance? And if we can move on then to our next petition, our next continued petition is Petition 1577 on Adult Cerebral Palsy Services lodged by Rachel Wallace. And can I welcome Marta Fraser, MSP, for this petition? I know you've been involved from the beginning. The petition is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to develop and provide funding for a clinical pathway and services for adults with cerebral palsy. This petition was last considered on 24th May 2018, when it was agreed to defer consideration of the petition until publication of the National Action Plan on Neurological Conditions. A consultation on a draft of the National Action Plan has been published by the Scottish Government, which sets out the vision of improving diagnosis, treatment and care of people with neurological conditions in Scotland, and describes how the Scottish Government intends to achieve this vision. The consultation closed on 8th February 2019 and the Scottish Government aimed to publish the final plan in the first quarter of 2019. Minutes from the National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions confirms that the final plan is now due to be published in the autumn of 2019. Since the papers were published, we have received a written submission from the petitioner, which is included in our papers. In her submission, she refers to involvement in Health Improvement Scotland's Neurological Standards Development Committee. These standards are intended to apply to all neurological conditions and the petitioner is of the view that although they are a good starting point, they are not enforceable and do not solve the problems raised in the petition. And on a similar note, the petitioner states that the Scottish Government has not resolved any of the issues raised in the petition. Um, and we want to obviously ha think about how we take this forward. Can I again perhaps ask Murdo Fraser to make a contribution to help us in our consideration of the petition? Um, th thank you, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak briefly again to the petition. Um, I've been in, in contact uh, again with Rachel Wallace, who's the petitioner, and she has put in a, a written submission, as, as you've uh, mentioned. Uh, and although um, she has been involved in some work going on, I think she still feels this is not meeting the, the, the needs of people with cerebral palsy and doesn't go far enough. Uh, she also mentions in her, in her letter a very unfortunate incident that happened earlier this year, uh, where I was involved trying, trying to assist her. She was an inpatient for a, a treatment at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee. Whilst uh, an inpatient, um, uh, something that, that, that would almost be comical were it not so serious, um, uh, she was in, in, in the bathroom in, in the hospital ward. A bathroom fitting fell off the wall. As a result of that, she fell and fractured her ankle in two places. 
Um, and this is a result of just poor maintenance in the hospital. The consequence of that was she ended up uh, back in a hospital bed. The author, orthopaedic consultant at the hospital had no understanding of the issues around cerebral palsy and was ready to discharge her back home where she would have needed 24-hour care. And it was only due to the intervention of her parents and her GP with a little uh, help uh, fr from myself on the outside that we managed to get her transferred instead to uh, Perth Royal Infirmary, where fortunately uh, they had a better understanding of the needs of people with uh, cerebral palsy and where she able to get uh, a rehabilitation bed where she stayed for some time before she was able to uh, return home and get some of the physiotherapy that she needed. But it is the petitioner's view that this is a, just a, a, you know, a very good example of the lack of understanding uh, that too many people in the, in the NHS have of the condition of cerebral palsy and reinforces the message that um, there is a need for a clinical pathway that is well understood by uh, clinicians. Um, so people in, uh, in her condition uh, don't face the, the treatment that she has personally just experienced just a few months ago. Okay, thank you very much for that. I wonder if people have any comments on how we take this forward. Brian? Uh, thank you, Kavina. I think, can I just mention once again, another neurological condition uh, being brought forward um, in the petitions committee that uh, we seem to have a lack of a, a, a understanding and pathway for. And it's something I'm actually really quite interested in because I'm thinking maybe going back 10 years ago, I used to coach somebody with cerebral palsy and, and all the conditions that they have and, and, and uh, the requirements that they have. It seems to me we've not made any progress since those days in fighting for services. And I think, again, I'm going to say our pathways for neurological conditions seem to be uh, seem to be coming up short here, and I think this, uh, you know, this, this obviously this is a very specific uh, petition, but there is a much wider uh, issue here. Um, I mean, I think we obviously have to wait, uh, or, or at least ask for an update um, uh, on, on the, the draft and the national uh, action plan. Uh, I, I do appreciate that that's still in in, uh, in train, but uh, I, I do think we have a bigger issue here. Okay, I mean, I think. We have been given a, um, a written submission from the petitioner, but she hasn't commented on the National Action Plan on Neurological Conditions. I wonder if it would be worth asking her specifically to comment on that and her engagement with it and how that effect of that has been. Mm -hmm. um, although I do note that I think part of her suggestion is that you might have a generalised thing that's not specific enough to the particular condition and therefore there's not that you know, understanding in, in the system how you respond specifically, and I'm just... Rachel? I agree. I, I would like to know um, if the draft um, plan actually uh, contains a commitment to add cerebral palsy uh, uh, into the neurological condition, um, well, because currently it doesn't fit, according to the petitioner, alongside the likes of um, MS or... Um, Parkinson's and epilepsy. So is, is there going to be a substantial um, amount of work included in that for people who um, live with cerebral palsy? Okay, so what we're doing then is we would write and ask the petitioner to the extent she's been engaged in comments on um, the National Action Plan, but also write specifically to the Scottish Government to say to what extent will their plan address the action called for in the petition, which is around the specifics of cerebral palsy. So you kind of have for completeness there. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay. In that case, it's, there's, there, we, we would continue the petition in order to get that information, that, um, and it would be useful if the petitioner was able to give us that information, but specifically going back to the Scottish Government to understand the difference between general and specific and to what extent they want to address those specifics. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for your attendance. If we can now move on to the next petition um, for consideration, which is Petition 1603 on ensuring greater scrutiny, guides and consultation on armed forces visits to schools in Scotland by Mary Campbell-Jack and Douglas Beattie on behalf of Quaker in Scotland and Forces Watch. Members will recall that we last considered this petition in November 2018. We agreed to write to the Scottish Government in relation to the use of child rights and wellbeing impact assessment on the issue of armed forces visits to schools. And can I welcome Maurice Corey, MSP, um, who's attending for this petition. 
In his written submission to the committee in July 2019, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills stated that as the Scottish Government, quote, does not hold the policy for the content of what is delivered in schools, quote, unquote, a child's right and wellbeing impact assessment by the Scottish Government is not directly applicable to this situation. In response, the petitioners question whether there are other assessment processes and forms of oversight and guidance that would be appropriate if not a child's right and wellbeing impact assessment. Um, I don't know if people have used this. I wonder, Morris, if you want to say something first before we... Yes, I, I, I would like to, Kavina, if I could. Um, yeah, basically, I think the most overriding point is, is that we cannot deny any pupil the, the right or the opportunity to uh, just explore all career opportunities um, whilst they're going through the, the formative years in, in secondary school and to allow them to make that decision uh, for the most appropriate decision, that they, the, the most appropriate career that they wish to follow. Um, and I think that's really the clear message here. Um, certainly from the research I've done, is that um, the schools are doing everything they can to talk with, with, with the military. The military, likewise, are talking with all the schools. And I would say to the committee here today that I think it'd be an opportunity for maybe to talk to the, heat, the head teacher's body in Scotland and to ask their view uh, about this, because after all, the decision, as you know, lies with the head teacher on it coming to access. Um, now, I know from the armed forces side, they're doing everything they can. They've laid out everything very clearly. The records are all there, what they do. They don't actively go out and recruit. They can't do that. They simply are informing. It's an, it's an information, there's a, there's a project called CAPE, which is keep the army in the public eye for the army side. The Navy is the same, the RAF is the same. Uh, and so what it is, it's an information. Now, it could be uh, anybody coming from the veterinary side of business or, 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 or from any other industry, engineering. It, it's the same basis. And I know from my own work um, in this that uh, teachers are well aware of that. And I have known teachers not to allow people to come back because they have taken a certain angle. It happened in Oban, uh, where um, it, it, was, it was clearly uh, concerned. There was, a, there, there was a, a, a review of it, and it was sorted out. Um, so there is a very good control currently in place. And I do not think the, that our children and our pupils that are coming up should in any way be uh, restricted from, from, from seeing what our career opportunities are there. And some of them, it's been the turning point in their lives. I know from the Connect movement, parents ring in and say, great, thanks very much. It's fantastic what you're doing for our child. Just in terms of the Public Petitions Committee, I think we have taken the opportunity to explore actually how this works, where the transparency is, to address the concerns around. I think way back in the day I said there are some people who took the view that poverty was a recruiting sergeant for the army and there would be concerns that poor communities were targeted. Um, I think it's important that we have confidence it is transparent, mm -hmm. but actually to me, the other divide here is between those who simply believe that from a perfectly legitimate perspective, that young people should not be encouraged to go into the armed services. They regard it as, you know, we talked about the risk um, and, it, and some of it is about a world view about the role of, of the armed forces and so on. I, I think the question I would want to put to the committee is whether we can usefully do any more than this. Are we satisfied? ourselves that there's sufficient transparency and safeguards in the system that, you know, I think even as the Deputy First Minister said, it's not for it's not at Scottish Government level to do those assessments, but there must be a reassurance that there is assessment done and there's security, whoever it is that's coming in, not just somebody who's coming from the armed forces, but maybe somebody coming from a private company. Mm -hmm. And I know from the Education Committee, actively the policy of government is to encourage industry links links with local employers and so on so in, in that sense anybody who's coming in they would be looking for safeguards so i suppose the question i'm posing to the committee is do we think there's anything further that we can do with this petition um or is it something that we could consider closing on the basis that i think an important piece of work has been done around shining a light on the processes and the importance of transparency for anybody who's been brought into school right yeah, thank you Kevin. i think I um, actually do think that uh, we've gone as far as we need to go. I think one of the things that uh, struck me over the, the, the recess there, having um, met several people in the, the, this uh, arena, that, that, that actually we have to recognise that 
um, the army can be a very positive destination um, for, for, uh, for, 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 for people. And, and I don't think we should question that. And I think my problem here is that we're now starting to get to a position, if we take this any further, um, uh, as Morris Corey says, we're starting to question the judgment of head teachers. Yeah. And it's their, it's their judgment. So for me, um, I, I, would, I, I, am, I am content with the evidence that we've got, that we've received, that uh, we're, we've taken this as far as we possibly can. And, and to be uh, fair, it would be the judgment of head teachers constrained and limited by mm -hmm. procedures and um, expectation of what is a reasonable, you know, um, it may just be me, I wouldn't devolve to head teacher all responsibility for um, who comes into the school, but they would be accountable for who comes into the school. They're not entirely free agents, I don't think. Um, but we can't go any further on this as well, convener, because we would be undermining head teachers' um, integrity over who that is invited into the school, whether it's a private organisation or it's a public body. Um, and um, my colleague, Maurice Corrie, made the point that um, the army are not allowed to recruit, um, and it is uh, at the behest of the head teacher to invite them in in the first place. And so, if we are confident that the process is uh, robust, then I don't think this committee can take it any further. Okay, any other views? I think that um, what we could do um, in agreeing to close the petition, first of all, recognise the important job that was done by the petitioners in, in highlighting this and allowing us to test the evidence and concerns that uh, vulnerable communities of young people might have been targeted. Um, but that in closing it, we, we could write to the Scottish Government simply to draw to their attention the, um, uh, the outstanding points that petitioners have made and of course I would also make the point to the petitioners that um, they, they would have the opportunity and facility within a year to bring the petition back if they had further evidence that in fact their concerns had not been addressed. Um, would that be agreeable to the committee? Yeah. Okay, in that case we're agreeing to close the petition um, but we would write to the, the Scottish Government to, attend, um, to draw to their attention the petitioners outstanding points to highlight to the petitioners that of course they are uh, free to bring a petition back at a later stage and to thank them for um, the opportunity this petition has afforded to really kind of focus in and give people some reassurance about how this process works. If we can then move on to petition one, our next petition, which is petition 1619 on access to continuous glucose monitoring lodged by Stuart Knox calling the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make continuous glucose monitoring sensors available under prescription to all patients with type 1 diabetes. This petition was last considered on 24th January 2019 when we heard evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. Two written submissions have subsequently been received from the Cabinet Secretary as a follow-up to the oral evidence. The petitioner has been invited to provide a response to these submissions, but no response has been received to date. It has been previously noted that the Scottish Government has invested £10 million over the course of the current parliamentary session to increase NHS Scotland's provision of insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitoring technology. The Cabinet Secretary's submission from 30th January 2019 makes it clear that NHS boards have been made aware that this funding is in addition to local diabetes technology budgets. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. My only concern was I still don't think we had an answer to the question about funding being available um, to ride this, but actually not funding to cover the cost of the VAT. So that there was there's a gap between what was claimed, the provision being provided, and the reality of it. I don't think that that has been addressed. I'm not sure if it's a sufficient issue for us to continue with the petition. I'm just simply make that observation. Brian? I think this uh, this petition has made significant progress. Um, I think since um, it, it's, it came into the into the parliament, I think my my overwhelming worry is that um, the availability of, of the, this technology is not um, uh, uniform across the country, and that some. Some uh, NHS trusts are, 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 have taken this on board, and I know there's um, the others haven't. Um, so I, that, that's my, my one concern. Is that something that, as a committee, we should be looking at? I know, for example, in one particular region, there's only four have been <laughs> have actually been purchased, as opposed to other committees. Is that something this committee should be taking well, forward? Really, I, I don't think what the petition was seeking, but what we could do certainly 
um, highlight to the Health Committee that that's, that's something that we've observed in consideration of, of the petition. Um, Government, um, having uh, put, ensured that all NHS boards have it in within their formulary is an important point and kind of addresses what the petitioner was looking for. Um, I think what Brian Whittle is talking about is, is that the, those NHS boards have... Um, they have it in their gift to be able to um, uh, give out the freestyle li Libra. However, some have chosen not to. And I think your point, convenient about the cost aspect of it could become a barrier as well. But that's a different matter to what the petitioner was asking. OK. Can I, uh, my sense is that we're agreeing that we've probably it's run its course in, in the in Public Petitions Committee and that we'd want to close the petition mm -hmm. on the basis that the Scottish Government has provided evidence that additional funding for continuous glucose monitoring has been made available over the course of the current parliamentary session, but that in closing the petition we would highlight to the Health Committee the issue about whether health boards are then, um, if there's a patchiness in terms of them then delivering that. Um, and again, we would wish to thank the, the petitioner. Um, I think there has been important progress on um, as a consequence of the petition by Stuart Knox, and we hope that he feels that this has been a productive engagement with the Public Petitions Committee. Um, and, of course, it would be open to him again to bring a petition back at a later stage, uh, stage if he, he felt that was worthwhile. So, um, with that, we agree to close the petition? Agreed. Okay, thank you. We can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1673 on the operation and running of Child Protection Service in Scotland, lodged by James Mackey. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create an independent QC-led inquiry into the operation and running of child protection services in Scotland. The petition was last considered on 25th October 2018, when the committee agreed to write to the Minister for Child Care in early years, as well as agreeing to draw the petition to the attention of the Care Review, chaired by Fiona Duncan. Responses have been received from the Minister and from the petitioner. The Minister's submission confirmed that in April 2018, the Child Protection Systems Review Group reconvened and that its recommendations, recommendations continue to be taken forward as part of the Child Protection Improvement Programme. The submission also responds to a number of points raised by the petitioner, highlighting a range of legislative changes that have taken place regarding child protection, as well as changes made to the Children's Hearing at Scotland Act 2011. In response to the Minister's submission, the petitioner's um, 10th of June 2019 response stated that it is, quote, the same old, same old material. It repeats previously supplied information and does not accept that there are fundamental and major problems within current child protection. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Me again. Um, I think what came out to me is we, we have another petition coming through you know, we're working on at the moment in, in historical child sex abuse and, and the lack of support there uh, specifically in schools and I wonder whether there's a crossover here uh, and whether th th these two petitions have um, a, a very similar theme and whether we should be bringing this particular petition and the evidence we've taken from this particular uh, petition um, into, the other, uh, into the other one. Um, this is very, I think it's a very specific ask in this petition, which is very substantial, which is there is so little confidence in the child protection system, there should be an inquiry into that system, which they will, I think the petitioner would say has, um, operates in such a way that's unjust. Um, and I think it's a different thing to say, as the care review is doing, what's the experience of care experience children, um, and the broader parameters of that, or how do we support vulnerable uh, children, how do we protect children, that's quite different from saying we don't have confidence in a system that's underpinning it, mm -hmm. which I think has come, you know, it's quite that you know, the petitioner's journey has taken him to the place where he believes there's something seriously wrong here, mm -hmm. that there are people inside the system have a vested interest in not addressing some of these questions. I mean, these are very significant um, questions, I think. I'm just not convinced, I guess, at this stage that a QC-led inquiry is the solution. I would like to have confidence that the Scottish Government is constantly um, alert to the vulnerabilities young people have, the whole issue around child protection and identification. We know that a uh, named person, for example, is one attempt to address that, um, which is now, is now stalled. 
Um, but that feels like quite a different thing from saying that we're convinced the system not just isn't working effectively, but it's actively working against the interests of children, which is what I read from what the petitioner said in his evidence. Back to that is when the next when, this, when we next hear the reading of the um, of the petition, I was I was talking about some of the same issues are going to be raised, and you know, we're going to close. You know, we're thinking of closing this petition, but the same issues are going to be raised in the other petition as well. And I think, no, you haven't. No. <laughs> it's, it's my, it's my, well, I suppose the question my, would you ask is, we can in any future petition. We have this information from this petition to hand. Um, is the solution in that petition going to be an independent QC-led inquiry, or is it saying actually there are there are gaps in the way in which we, the child protection um, works, and we want to to improve that? I think, I think we... Just just for clarity, um, convener, obviously, as you know, that petition is is uh, my con my constituent. And uh, over, over the piece she's been working on, the outcomes that uh, she's looking for specifically from the petition. So I am, I am aware of what's coming down the track. Do people have other views? The um, Child Protection Systems Review Group will hopefully be looking at um, the current child uh, protection methods and procedures in Scotland. However, that doesn't really address the petitioner's um, requirement. in the system and believes the system operates against yeah. families. Yeah. Our the decision we need to make is whether continuing the petition, are we saying we think we have evidence that that's the case? And it's not to say that is, you cannot deny somebody their experience and that's their view. Um, and whether it's within the, the, the role of this public petition if, to be effective around this. Um, I wondered whether... We have to make a decision whether we want to close the petition or not, but even in doing so, it may be that we could um, refer the work of the, you know, this evidence to the Education um, and Skills Committee in terms of any future work it may wish to conduct in relation to child protection, because that is one of its responsibilities. So that evidence and that view would be sitting there, um, and the committee would have... Um, you know, it, 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 they would be aware of, of this, these concerns. Um, I, I think the decision we need to make just now, do we think the case has been made for us to continue to press for, um, on behalf of the petitioner for an independent QC-led inquiry? David? Okay, I'm happy to close the petition, because the government's already indicated it's not going to do what the petitioner's called for. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I was quite concerned reading through all the evidence that this particular individual seems to have had a really, really bad experience. And also since submitted a petition has been contacted by, well, what he said is a large number of people in support. So it's obvious to me that there are people who don't have faith in a system due to individual um, experience. And that is concerning. But for this specific ask, I agree that I don't think that's the right way to go about it. But I don't think that we should completely leave it. So I agree with your suggestion about passing it on to lead committee with a view to some sort of action being taken somewhere further down the line. But it, as for the specific ask, I think, um, yeah, I don't think we're, we're going to get there. Okay. So. For the, for the um, in interest of clarity, can I suggest that what we do is close the petition, but that we highlight to the Education Skills Committee um, the view that's been expressed around this, around this petition so we don't mislead the petition into thinking that the, the Education Skills Committee will automatically take up this um, yeah. suggestion. But I think you know, you're right that people's direct experience brings them to certain conclusions. Yeah. Um, but I think where we would probably agree with the petitioner, as in um, many other people, is we want, a, a, we want people to have confidence in the child protection system, it ought not to be intrusive, but it ought to, at the same time to protect um, young people and there needs to be safeguards yeah. um, in, 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 both, in both ways. Mm -hmm. So I think we're agreeing that we want to close the petition and uh, I think uh, David is right to highlight that part of this is that the Scottish Government has no plans to undertake the action called for in the petition 
and, and that we will draw the issues raised in the petition to the attention of the Education Skills Committee and that we'd want to thank the petitioner um, for bringing the petition to the committee and also, as I've said already, there's an opportunity in the future for the petitioner to bring back a petition around these issues if they feel these questions have not been addressed satisfactorily. Okay, in that case, if we can move on to the next petition, which is for consideration, which is petition 1683, Support for Families with Multiples by Jennifer Edmonston, which was last considered in December 2018, when we agreed to write the Scottish Government and HMRC to seek further information around better support and changes in benefits and implications for the HMRC in relation to families with multiple births. Responses are included in our meetings papers. In our most recent submission to the committee, the petitioner continues to raise a number of concerns regarding support for families who are not classified as low income, but are stretched due to the particular challenges of having multiples. The petitioner has again highlighted the challenges for families of multiples in terms of childcare between the end of maternity leave and the commencement of funding, a funded childcare at three years old. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. This was one of the things I would be interested in asking the Minister is that the question of targeting resources, which actually I agree with, that you target vulnerable families and, and more disadvantaged families, and that's the argument that's put by the government around what support they offer to, to vulnerable families. But there are other things that we regard as universal, as baby boxes or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So clearly the government itself makes a judgment on these things. And I would just be interested in knowing how they looked at, which is not about income, but the impact of having more than one baby, having twins or triplets, even when you um, have a reasonably secure income. And would that be one of these issues round that range between targeted and universal that they might want to reflect on? I think that's a point that the petitioner um, herself has made. Because um, those uh, who've had multiple children are, can be priced out of the job market, they are at a significant disadvantage. And even if they're getting support, it's not the monetary support that, uh, that, that they're having to deal with. It's the other issues that are um, in, impacting on their lives that don't allow them to either get a job or... Um, all the other things that um, people with uh, one child or two children uh, are able to do. Okay. Brian? The, the, the bit that, 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 that kind of strikes me is that gap between you know, going back to work and, and accessing um, childcare. I mean, I think that, that, you know, that cost is significant no matter what your, your income is. And I think, you know, multiple births obviously multiply that uh, significantly. Um, yeah. Chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I think I, I, I think I think uh, as, as you suggest, uh, can be right into the, the, the minister for children and young people get the, their view on what the petitioner is actually raising. It. I think yes, to understand what assessment they have made of the impact of multiple births, mm. regardless of income and how supports can be put in place, but also where in the spectrum would they place support for families who have had multiple births between the most vulnerable, the target resource and uh, the kind of universal provision that's made available in some regards. Okay, um, and of course the, the petitioner will be able to respond to any evidence that we, we get back from the Minister for Children and Young People. We can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1688 on Permitted Development Rights and Conservation Areas, lodged by Alistair Ewan on behalf of Westerton Garden Suburbs Residents Association. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the permitted development rights legislation, which they consider impacts unfairly on residents of conservation areas and listed buildings in Scotland. The petition was last considered on the 24th of May 2018, and since then a submission has been received from the Scottish Government. The submission confirms that the Planning Scotland Act 2019 includes provisions that could allow authorities to waive or reduce fees in certain circumstances. The submission also highlights future work in this area, including work to take forward the provisions of the Planning Act. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Um, I think the first instance would be interesting to hear from the petitioner um, on, on their views uh, on the submissions that we've received. Okay, I think it would 
be useful to know whether they think that addresses um, their concerns or it's, it's sufficient, gives them sufficient confidence. Um, and perhaps writing to the Scottish Government to get further information on the publication timescales of their sustainability appraisal report, as well as information on timescales and progress of the review of the wider planning fee regime. I know that we dealt with the planning legislation um, recently, but actually there will be a pause between that and actually what then what, what's the time scale, scale for, this, for these changes? I think would be useful to know. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, we can move on to our next petition, which is the next continued petition for considerations, petition 1695 on access to justice in Scotland, lodged by Ben and Evelyn Mundell. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to take action to ensure that access to justice, including access to legal advice from appropriately trained lawyers and financial support through legal aid, is available to enable people in Scotland to pursue cases where they consider a human rights breach has occurred. And can I welcome David Stewart, MSP, um, for this petition. I understand that Edward Mountain, MSP, also has an interest. The petition was last considered on 8th November 2018, when the committee agreed to write to the Scottish Government. A response has been received, as well as a written submission from the petitioners. The Scottish Government submission from 5th February 2019 confirms that in response to the 2018 Independent Strategic Review of Legal Aid in Scotland, Rethinking Legal Aid, quote, a new legal aid system in Scotland will be developed that is user-focused and has the flexibility to adapt according to emerging situations and developments. As part of this work, the Scottish Government launched its Legal Aid Reform Consultation on 27th June 2019, looking at areas concerning the user's voice, the flexibility of the system, and whether it should be regarded as a public service. The petitioner's submission has been critical of the Scottish Government's response are of the view that, and are of the view that the Government has ignored the human rights aspect of their petition. I wonder if I could maybe ask David Stewart to come in at this point, since he's uh, had you, an interest in Thank you very much, um, convener. Time. Can I thank the committee for allowing me to come on to give some background information about this petition? Um, the committee will know that I've given evidence, I think, twice uh, before on um, the Mundell petition. And I'd also like to thank the other MSPs, such as Edward Mountain, who have uh, been very helpful in supporting this. Um, as I said last time, this, on the surface, is a highly complicated case, but I think it's well summarised in the papers that the committee have received. So on the surface, it's about the ring fencing of dairy farmers' milk quotas within the Southern Isles ring fenced area. But the fundamental question to me is how ordinary Scottish families on a modest income can seek redress and remedy for potential breaches of the European Convention on Human Rights and for injustice in general. I suppose to answer one question, convener, the simple answer is they should seek legal representation through the civil legal aid scheme. But you will know from my last presentation in, in November that the family have been in touch with more than 50 law firms um, in, in person or by phone. But the vast majority will not deal with human rights cases. Many of those who have said that they will will only deal with either prisoners or those with immigration issues. But to give you an example, one lawyer who agreed to take up the case wanted an upfront payment of £25,000 before proceeding. And that payment at the time represented double the family's yearly disposable income. So the Mandels have told me that uh, many farmers in the ring fence area were placed in an impossible situation with a milk price below the cost of production. So that led effectively to the forfeit of property. At the time, uh, the quota was worth probably around £450,000. So as I think identified in the November committee papers, that could be a potential breach of Article 1 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. I'm conscious, uh, convener, the time's very tight, so if I can conclude uh, by quoting from the report of the First Minister's Advisor Group on Human Rights, and I quote, progress then, progress then has evidently been made on Scotland's human rights journey. However, it's crit critical to acknowledge that there are gaps and shortcomings too. Too many people are not enjoying their rights in everyday life. All this leads to denial of access to justice and it's a matter of political choices and priorities. What is needed is the political will to implement the solution. So I believe there's unfinished business here for Scottish human rights. Uh, this has been illustrated by the Mundell petition, but is a wider issue. So I would urge the committee, because I know we've had been some time before the committee, I would urge the committee then to refer this case to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Okay, other views? Brian? Yeah, I um, <coughs> had a, a, a chat with uh, Edward Mountain uh, yesterday before, before I did say that I would 
raised this issue. Um, I think the, um, the Mendel certainly have raised issues around uh, the gaps and imbalances uh, that uh, uh, the current service uh, provides. I know they do feel that they have been sidelined and marginalised. Um, and, and there's a legislation here that's been hidden behind, which is benefiting a private company at the Mendel's expense. And the government believe their actions are in the national interest. Um, and surely, surely the, 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 the national interest here should be able to be accessed by the Mendel's and help the Mendel's. Um, and I think Edward's asking, I think we're missing uh, the mountains asking, I, I do agree with him that they, they needs to see a commitment from the Scottish government that they will uh, investigate this issue raised by the Mendels on its own merits, not as collective, uh, of, not as a collective of farmers, um, so that the, the Mr and Mrs Mendel can move a little bit closer towards a resolution. So I do, li I do like uh, uh, David Stewart's suggestion here that uh, I mean, it certainly seems to me to be a human rights issue um, that uh, they have, they don't seem to be able to access the services that would help them to get to a, a, a resolution and I think there's a little bit of stubbornness here from the, the Scottish Government in terms of uh, looking at this case on its own merit. The only thing I would say, I don't think it's our job to get Scottish Government to address an individual case. It is whether there are consequences of that case that are need to be addressed through the legal aid system um, or whether, which the point that Dave Stewart makes, is that actually they have a right to to appeal, but no lawyer will take the case up, which is quite different from saying it's not funded. And I, I'm not, I mean, I can only hear what Dave Stewart says, that human rights lawyers only take up cases around immigration and prisoners. I'm not sure if that is true, um, but it might be their experience that they couldn't get someone. I suppose that is, um, that is an interesting question. It looks as if the Scottish Government is running cons consultation on legal aid reform. And obviously, if that's unsatisfactory, the petitioner could, could come back in that regard. But I think there's been a suggestion that there's a sense that we don't want it to be lost completely. We want to refer it somewhere. And I think the question is whether it's which is the, the best committee for it to go to. There's been suggestion it be the Quality and Human Rights Commi Committee. I wonder if that's. Well, we mustn't um, have oversight of the uh, Justice Committee as well, because. Mm -hmm. It may be that uh, because the Scottish Government are um, reforming the legal aid system, that this is something that I, I think we should be careful which committee we refer it to. That's what I'm saying because there's 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 two angles there's two angles here. It, the, the issue for my, without um, speaking for the petitioners, my sense is the petitioners have found themselves in a set of circumstances and they want that resolved. And there's a number of ways in which they've tried to resolve it. And the final iteration of it has been that they've not been their human rights have been denied because they can't get access to legal aid to address the injustice they perceive to have experienced. So, if it goes to the justice Qu committee, it's a question of whether will they take that information in terms of the reform of legal aid, or if it goes to the Equality and Human Rights Committee, will they look at the denial of rights because a lawyer won't actually take the case up? Brian, just, just for. Just for uh, clarity can be a my my uh, issue around here is that I think the, the what the Mendels are highlighting here is a, a gap in the system you know um, and their inability to access what we would perceive as is uh, a, a general right uh, their right right of, of, of to, to, to legal aid and that's it's the gap that for me that's the, the, the big issue here Gail? Um I've been looking through the papers. I wonder, David, have they contacted the Equalities and Human Rights Commission about this? And yeah. what was the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I raised this, it was before uh, Gail Ross was, I think, on the committee, but I raised this in my uh, probably more detailed November submission um, that the, there was a quote I had from the, uh, the Scottish Human Rights Commission said that they were denied the ability to raise specific cases like that. And that doesn't happen in Northern Ireland. So, and that certainly was the case in November. I'm obviously separately happy to pursue the Scottish Human Rights about that, but we actually explored that option last time round. It's not the Scottish Human Rights, it's the Equalities in yeah. Human Rights. Yeah. So they're two different organisations. Yes, yeah. So yeah. one has got the ability to take up cases and the other doesn't. Yeah. So I just wondered if maybe but that what was... What you end up having, in, if you go to the Equality Human Rights Commission, they will say they'll refer you to the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Mm. They'll say because that's... So there's a kind of a, a gap in the system as well. I wonder whether the most 
useful thing to do, given that the last most recent submission from the petitioner is firmly focused on human rights, is that we refer it to the Equality and Human Rights Committee in the Parliament, and they then can address these questions. Would that be agreeable? Yeah. So we're not closing it, but we're referring it to the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Um, and obviously, we would hope that the Equality and Human Rights Committee would look at these questions, particularly around the ability to enforce a right, which seems to be at the heart of this, if a lawyer won't take up your case. OK, in that case, we can move on. And can I... I appreciate uh, the option that's come out here. Okay, thank you. And can I thank David Stewart for his uh, attendance and thank the petitioners for um, raising these issues with us. If we can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1704 on improving targets and outcomes for autistic people in Scotland, lodged by Duncan McGilvery. The petition was last considered on December 20th, 2018, and submissions have been received from the Scottish Government, a number of local authorities, and the petitioner. Um, the Scottish Government's submission confirmed that as part of the Scottish Autism Strategy, funding is in place until 2021 for the creation of the National Autism Implementation Team, comprising of experts that will provide national strategic guidance to NHS boards, amongst other activities. The submission also confirms that the Scottish Government has mandated all NHS boards to work with ISD Scotland in order to improve data collection relating to da autism diagnosis waiting times. The additional local authority submissions that have been received are broadly in line with those received previously in that they express sympathy with the petitioner's aims but have little support for the actions being called for in the petition. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. One thing I would say was I thought there was a gap between what the local authorities would say, which they're understandably looking at, well, is this doable for us? and from some of the organisations that represent people with autism, National Autism Society and, and the other groups that have been highlighted in our papers. Um, and I just wonder, I just felt that there's so much in here and so many concerns and, of course, my own direct experience, and I'm sure it's not just me, with families of people with autism and the amount of pressure they're under and the extent yeah. to which they feel the system is not dealing with them. And indeed, the petitioner himself, um, I think, has been clear that he's not able anymore to engage with the public petitions committee it's because he has so much else in his life to be going on with that I think we owe the petitioner and this issue a bit more attention, but I would be interested in what people think we might be able to do. But I slightly disappointed by the um, lack of submissions from um, the local authorities. I mean, they were very interesting um, nonetheless. And um, the, the Western Isles Council uh, had said that um, they want to they want to achieve diagnosis within a year, but the number of referrals um, that's coming that are coming through is making that very difficult. And I think the petitioner is very reasonable in asking for um, you know, uh, some sort of uh, time uh, or, or um, I, sp I suppose something that they can aim for, which doesn't seem achievable. Um, even though the Scottish Government are putting resources towards it. You know, we've got a lack of specialists within this area. Um, there needs to be more of a recruitment drive. And, and yes, it, it's words from the Scottish Government, but really on the ground, I, I'm not quite sure whether that is actually the case. I'm going to contradict myself a wee bit here as well. I think that there's huge issues in here. Um, and I know that some autism organisations have argued for an autism act, but you'll know from the paperwork that they're still looking at whether that would be the best approach. I'm just conscious that the petitioner himself has says that he wouldn't be able to engage further. Mm. I wonder, is there something about that just to respect what has been said in the petition and the information we've got, is there somewhere we can, you know, not so much refer the petition, but accept that at this moment what's been called for by the... the petitioner is, hasn't, has got limited support, that we recognise there are huge issues that it flags up that the petitioner himself is not going to be engaged with. Is this something we could perhaps, in closing the petition, pass on to the Education Skills Committee again? Um, and whatever else, because I, I just it, f it feels to me as if there's something really important here, but it's not necessarily going to be resolved through the Petitions Committee. Mm -hmm. But that in highlighting this, the petitioner has enabled a range of organisations actually to flag up the evidence that they've got 
and that we maybe could refer it to, for example, the Education Skills Committee um, to look at when they're looking at additional support needs and all the whole issues around transitions. I wonder if people have views on that. Yeah. Even though the petitioner doesn't feel able to be able to um, continue with this, uh, which is understandable, um, if, if what the petitioner is asking for, um, um, it, it actually, what I'm saying is it reflects on the number of um, people who contact me, constituents who contact me regarding all of these issues that the petitioner has raised. And just because the petitioner is unable, uh, perhaps due to that, his condition or her condition, it, it, his condition, is that um, it's not that we should ignore it. Then that what we do do is close the petition, um, but that we, we do acknowledge there are very significant issues being highlighted here that we, we pass on to the Education Skills Committee um, the, the evidence that we've, we've been provided with um, and perhaps you know, raise with the Scottish Government that we, we believe this petition is a reflection of a, a deeper concern um, and we would hope that they would um, address that in their strategy where there's some suggestion there's a kind of a gap between um, the strategy and delivery on the ground, and perhaps it's something we could also flag up with the Health Committee. Mm -hmm. Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay, on that basis, can we close the petition? But as I've said already, I want to emphasise um, our gratitude to the petitioner for raising these issues when, like with so many people in these circumstances, not only are they trying to raise these issues, but they're also trying to um, provide the support to their loved one at the same time, and that's a um, a massive challenge that um, we recognise and that we will um, uh, provide information both to the Education Skills Committee and the Health Committee about the evidence that we has uh, been provided to us. So the next petition is Petition 1708 on catering for vegans on all public sector menus, lodged by Mark Banahan on behalf of the Vegan Society and Go Vegan Scotland, calls for the Scottish Government to bring forward legislation to guarantee plant-based options on every public sector menu every day to protect the rights of vegans and for our health, the environment and animals. The petition was last considered in December 2018. The clerk's note summarises submissions that have been received from a number of NHS health boards, the Scottish Parliament corporate body, the Scottish Government and the petitioner. In its submission, the Scottish Government stated that, quote, veganism is not a protected characteristic for the purposes of the Equality Act 2010, and nor are there specific responsibilities in this area for public bodies under ECHR or the Human Rights Act 1998. The Scottish Government also highlights its Good Food Nation proposals for legislation, which do not include legislative provisions with regard to veganism or other specific diets. Since the meeting papers were published, the committee has received a submission from the petitioner and members have been provided with a copy of that submission. In the submission, the petitioner provides a detailed challenge to the Scottish Government's assertion that there are no legal duties to vegans under existing legislation. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, I've, got, I've got to say that uh, my, my thought would be to close the petition. Um, because, as I said, the Scottish Government have no plans to amend the law. Um, but I do note uh, that they brought forward the um, Good Food Nations Bill, or they're, they're going to bring forward the Good, no Good Food Nation Nations Bill, and I would suggest that in closing the, pe closing the petition, uh, we write uh, to the, the appropriate minister uh, to, to highlight the, the issues that have been raised by the, the, the petitioner themselves and see whether or not he's prepared to include some sort of um, uh, amendment within the, the, the bill and the legislation to, to uh, address these issues. Would it be reasonable to say that we would highlight the Scottish Government this issue has been brought forward, that they may want to look at, I'm sure they will be looking at it in terms of the Good, Fool, Good Food Bill, but of course the petitioners themselves, I have no doubt, will be engaging with individual MSPs and the committee who will be dealing with the bill um, they could take the opportunity to provide evidence um, uh, to that committee. Because I think there's a difference between perhaps the idea that it's a rights issue mm -hmm. between that and the fact that there are an increasing number of vegans. Um, my own son uh, is, a, is a vegan and I, th you know, I think the system becomes more flexible. You know, 
restaurants will provide vegan options in a way that didn't maybe even five years ago. Mm -hmm. Somebody my age, a, a vegetarian option was regarded as very exotic and was usually just a, an egg or something. Um, so I think the world has moved on. What we would hope is public bodies would be alive to that when they're actually yeah. providing menus for people. And you can see, you know, I, I would have some sympathy for somebody who's a vegan going into hospital and there's not any Absolutely. need to consider their dietary requirements in a normal way. Yeah. The question is whether, you know, you see it's a rights issue or simply um, a public service issue. And I think, you know, if we agree to close it, we would recognise there are other opportunities for the campaigners and the petitioners to take this through um, in, the good, in the Good Food Bill. Um, but there are, I, have a, I also take the view that some of this comes from demand too, but the public sector has to keep up with the way in which the world has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody else has any comments. David? No. Okay. In that case, can we agree that we'll close the petition understanding order rule 15.7 um, and while we recognise the Scottish Government has confirmed there's no plans to amend the law with regard to veganism, we do note the opportunities um, around the good food legislation itself. Um, I'd want to thank the petitioners for the effort they've, they've come to in relation to giving us evidence and have their continued engagement with the committee. And of course, they too have the opportunity um, to bring forward a, a further petition at, later, petition at a later stage if they feel there are issues that still need to be addressed. And if we can then move on to the next petition, which is petition 1713, on the ban of the use of mosquito devices in Scotland, lodged by Amy Lee Freoli, MSYP, and Kit McCarthy, MSYP, on behalf of the Scottish Youth Parliament. The petition was last considered in December 2018. The clerk's note summarises responses received from the Scottish Government, Police Scotland and the Children and Young People's Commissioner of Scotland and the petitioner. The Scottish Government has made clear that it does not support the use of mosquito devices. However, it states that it is unable to ban the use of the devices as it is outside the competence of the Scottish Parliament. The petitioner continues to believe that the Scottish Government does have the power to ban mosquito devices but is choosing not to. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Right. Huge sympathy for the petition, obviously. Um, um, there's obviously this a debate whether or not there's, there's competence within the Scottish Parliament or not. I would imagine that that's not particularly difficult to, to establish. definitely think we should be drawing the petition, um, uh, notice of petition to the UK uh, government, uh, to, to their attention. Uh, it's whether or not we can, we can do any more in this committee. Uh, but I mean, without, without question, the petitioner has raised a, a very significant issue. I think probably um, a lot of people would have sympathy with. Certainly, I do. David, I support for Brian's uh, stance here. I think we should actually maybe um, pass, as he says, on to the UK government. But Westminster has a petitions committee. Maybe we could pass it on to him. Well, what we could do is suggest the petitioner yeah. that they do that if yes. they wanted to. My only question is that. The Scottish Government's position is they're not responsible for either licensing them or determining whether they can be used or not. But that was also the case in relation to a ban on smoking at one point. There was an argument, well, actually, you, you know, it's not within the, the, the gift of the Scottish Parliament to do that. But what the Scottish Parliament did was they found, um, and quite rightly, a health defence for a ban. So within the powers of the Parliament, we found a way of doing that. And I just wonder whether that's something that the Scottish Government has explored. Is, I mean, there's an issue around, for example, and it is in the evidence, that um, young people with autism would be disproportionately affected by it. So is there a question around the rights of young people with autism? Um, is there an issue around the public bodies, the public buildings for which public authorities have responsibility who could refuse to use them? So we may not be able to stop somebody putting one up outside their door. But could you stop? I mean, I know that from having heard from the petitioner, one of the issues that uh, one of them particularly was exercised by the fact that they're very often in railway stations or there have been evidence of them being in railway stations. Yeah. And at one level, I can understand you don't want uh, groups of young people gathering at night and frightening other neighbours, frightening passengers or causing disturbance or whatever. Um, and presumably that was the motive for it. But there are opportunities within a devolved settlement to look at how you might at least limit the use of these. Yeah. And I don't know whether the question is whether we keep the petition open and ask that question, 
or we close the petition on the basis of the actions called for is, is out with the competence of the Scottish Government or, but, or the Scottish Parliament, but perhaps we could flag up to the Scottish Government as an issue and ask them if it's something that they would look at. I think, Deal? Um, convener, that... I mean, I was I was kind of semi-involved. There was one in uh, Waverley Station. It wasn't actually Waverley Station that I put it up, but one of the um, shops, I believe, and had a few submissions from uh, members of the Scottish Youth Parliament. And I think that you make a valid point. I don't think we should close it at the moment while that is still outstanding. I think that we need to explore different ways. And if there is a health risk that, you know, or, or some sort of health um, angle that we can come at it. I mean, if it can be closed and we can still ask them to explore that, then I'm happy with that. But I definitely think that, that should be explored. Brown? I was actually going to say exactly that, 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 that uh, we should be looking at it, or the Scottish Government should be looking at this from a health perspective, uh, because under under that they have definitely have got competence and perhaps we can, we can, we can manoeuvre some sort of legislation into that in that, in that respect. What we do is, um, I think our, our sense is there's a limit to what else we can do as a committee, but that before we close it, we would write to Scottish Government and ask them to respond to this suggestion that they, they may have an ability under their health-related powers to look at this. And even if we got a commit from, commitment from them to explore that, we could then perhaps close it at that stage and it would allow the petitioners to pursue it yeah. further. Agreed. Agreed. OK. That's good. Yeah. Um, and the question of research, I think, is actually important mm -hmm. in that regard as well. Yeah. OK. Um, in that case, I think we, we're, we're clear that there's a limit to what we can do as a petition committee on this, but that we would be keen the Scottish Government would rather than simply saying it's out with their um, competence at the moment, would they look at it in relation to this health, um, area of health responsibility and would welcome the response in that. Yeah. Um, and with that, um, I want to thank you all for your attendance and I'll close the meeting. Thank you.